Hi, and welcome to today's episode of Piano TV. I am Alicia, your host, and today we are going to take a look at the life and times of Sergei Rachmaninoff. And I did have to look up how to pronounce his name on dictionary.com. Rachmaninoff is what it told me to say. I have been mispronouncing his name all this time, so hopefully those of you familiar with the Russian language will accept Rachmaninoff as my pronunciation. It's a little bit of a tangent to start this video on. What we are going to talk about in today's video is Rachmaninoff's life story, the accomplishments that he achieved in his lifetime, his death, his personality, all that good stuff. So let's get started. Let's start with the basics. Rachmaninoff was born in 1873 in Russia during the late Romantic period of music. He did write a lot of late Romantic style pieces, but he also wrote a lot of early 20th century modern style pieces as well. He was a virtuoso pianist and he did plenty of touring and conducting in his lifetime, which lasted 70 years. He was also greatly influenced by other significant Russian composers such as Tchaikovsky, who was his idol. His piano and orchestral compositions are generally considered to be very expressive and very melodic because he was highly influenced by vocal works. Rachmaninoff was born into a wealthy and musical family in Russia and he had five siblings. And like pretty much any other significant composer, he was a virtuoso and showed a lot of great musical promise at the early age of four. By the time Rachmaninoff was 12, two of his sisters had died. One was an older sister who was the one who introduced him to the music of Tchaikovsky. So this early teen Rachmaninoff started slacking off at school and he was actually about to flunk out, but his mom ended up saving him by transferring him to the Moscow Conservatory instead in the year 1885. During his time in Moscow, Rachmaninoff befriended Scriabin, another well-known composer. He started doing better in school. He was awarded a scholarship, although one of his teachers was strongly against him getting into composing. Apparently composing wasn't for serious musicians, but Rachmaninoff, little rebel that he was, composed anyway. In 1892, during Rachmaninoff's last year of school, he began his performing and composing career in earnest, which earned him praise from Tchaikovsky himself for an opera called Aleko. Rachmaninoff wasn't expecting this to go well at all. It was basically like a sign of self-doubt that would persist throughout his life. And Rachmaninoff was very surprised with its massive success and Tchaikovsky's approval. It also earned the highest mark for a final composition at the Moscow Conservatory. His public debut as a pianist happened in 1892 when he was 19 years old. He performed his own piece, Prelude in C-sharp minor, which is one of his more well-known piano compositions. When Tchaikovsky died of cholera in 1893, Rachmaninoff was devastated. He wrote his trio Elegiac No. 2 for piano, violin, and cello as a tribute, and basically fell into a deep depression afterwards. He was teaching piano, and he went on a tour that made him completely miserable, and he didn't even earn very much money while he was at it. He completed his first symphony, and it debuted in 1897, and it was a complete flop. One music critic said that it would be admired by inmates of a music conservatory in hell. This is a very harsh criticism. The symphony performers didn't do well either, in part because the conductor was probably drunk. Rachmaninoff said that he wasn't so much upset at the outward criticism, but he was deeply distressed and heavily depressed by the fact that my symphony did not please me at all after its first rehearsal. This symphony was not performed again in his lifetime. This event sent him into a creative and depressive funk that lasted for years. Eventually he got into conducting, which did help alleviate some of his depression, but the fact that he was so depressed really kept his compositional output to a minimum. He wasn't really writing a whole lot. His auntie even arranged a visit with the very famous writer Leo Tolstoy, hoping that a meeting of the two minds would re-inspire him and getting get him productive again but even though it was a pleasant enough encounter it didn't spark any productivity in Rachmaninoff. By 1900 Rachmaninoff's family suggested that it might be time for some professional help to deal with the depression and Rachmaninoff was like yeah for sure I agree with this. He had a doctor named Nikolai Dahl and the two of them made a lot of progress in a really short amount of time. Rachmaninoff was re-inspired and he completed his second piano concerto, one of his most well-known works, and dedicated it to his therapist. Even at the time this composition was really well received and it earned him the Glinka Award and a cash prize. Rachmaninoff married his first cousin, Natalia Satina, in 1902 when he was 29 years old. The happy couple 
had two daughters in Moscow, and he continued his life as a music teacher and conductor. As a conductor, he was really strict, and he worked with soloists individually to perfect their performances, and that was kind of an unusual practice. He went gallivanting around Italy with his family after growing tired of conducting, and also because of the effects that Russian politics had on his job. When he returned to Russia with no job, his only real option for money at the time was composition. But due to the political situation of Russia and having a big social life, Rachmaninoff couldn't find the time to compose when he was there. So the family ended up packing up and moving to Dresden, Germany, and they lived there between 1906 to 1909. This was a good inspired period of his life, despite periodic bouts of depression that kept peaking up. And he steeled himself to finally write his second symphony. It premiered in 1908, and unlike the first symphony, it was very well received, winning him more awards. Around this time, he also went on tour in the United States, performing his third piano concerto with Gustav Mahler as the conductor, who was someone that Rachmaninoff really admired, and he cherished that experience as one of his best musical life experiences. In 1914, World War I began, and Rachmaninoff wasn't actually enlisted because he was technically a government servant as a music director at a school but he did donate plenty of money to the war effort. His old school friend Scriabin died the year later in 1915, something that affected Rachmaninoff deeply, and he ended up raising a benefit concert to raise money for Scriabin's widow. This set of concerts was when Rachmaninoff had some of his first experiences publicly performing other people's works. He played a lot of Scriabin's music for this tour to raise money. Uh, before this point, he basically just played his own music. By 1917, the communist authorities seized Rachmaninoff's estate and the family had to start traveling. In Moscow, it was such a serious situation that when Rachmaninoff was revising his first piano concerto, you could hear gunshots outside. He received an offer to go on a Scandinavian music tour and he jumped on the opportunity just to get himself and his family out of the country, basically bringing their entire life's possessions in only a few suitcases and leaving everything else behind. Since he had abandoned his estate and pretty much all of his personal belongings, Rachmaninoff was pretty broke at this point. But luckily he had a lot of friends and people to help him out and provide support. And he also had enough cred as a composer and musician to make ends meet. But prior to this point, he hadn't really been much of a performer. So he spent a lot of time developing a bigger repertoire so he could earn money performing because he had a pretty small, again, since he really only played mostly his own music. He had to learn other composers' music so he could be a better performer. Eventually, he was given an offer to be a conductor in the United States, which was an offer he did initially turn, turn away from just because he didn't have warm and fuzzy memories of being in the United States. And he also didn't want to live far away from home. But it was financially advantageous for him to do so. So he did pack up and move to New York City in 1918. And at this point, Rachmaninoff was basically like a modern day pop star. Whatever hotel he would be staying at, people would crowd around outside of that hotel in hopes to see him. He was a really big deal in, in the United States at that point. Over the next several years, he toured across the United States and visited California with his family for rest and recuperation. The Rachmaninoff family was doing quite well at this point. They had enough money for personal chefs and servants, and they did have a, a home away from home, kind of like a cottage in Switzerland. They clung hard to their Russian identity and decorated their flat in New York in the Russian styles. They maintained a Russian community, spoke largely only in Russian, had Russian friends, etc. They didn't really integrate into the melting pot of American culture. Rachmaninoff was also one to enjoy nice suits and fancy cars with his money, but he didn't hoard that money. He was a generous man. He donated a lot of money to the war efforts and especially to people in need back home in Russia. He became friends with the legendary Russian pianist Vladimir Horowitz. When Horowitz performed Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 3, Rachmaninoff remarked, this is the way I always dreamed my concerto should be played, but I never expected to hear it that way on earth. Between the time of his arrival in New York in 1918 and his death in 1942, Rachmaninoff actually only composed six new works, and he revised some old ones too. About this really slowed output, Rachmaninoff said, I left behind my desire to compose, losing my country, I lost myself also. Rachmaninoff's daughters lived in Paris, and the last time all four family members, both parents and daughters, were together was in Paris in 1939, before Rachmaninoff fled Paris because of war. 
You can also hear recordings of Rachmaninoff. It was in 1939 when he returned to America that he started really getting into recording his music, um, particularly her, his first and third concerto. By 1942, he was starting to have health issues and his doctor recommended that he permanently move to California just to be in a warmer climate, thinking that would be good for his health. So Rachmaninoff relocated to Beverly Hills. Another famous guy who lived in Beverly Hills at the time was Vladimir Horowitz. Rachmaninoff also bonded with Stravinsky, since they were both from Russia and they both had children in Paris during the war. Despite experiencing severe lower back pain and fatigue, Rachmaninoff continued to perform and tour, but he did have to cut a final tour short because of his ill health. And at that point, he was diagnosed with melanoma, which is basically skin cancer. He performed a final recital in early 1943, which included a performance of Chopin's second piano sonata, of which there is a funeral march movement. He succumbed to cancer on March 28, just four days before his 70th birthday. Rachmaninoff had wanted to be buried in Moscow along Skryabin and his other peers, but since he was a naturalized American citizen, that just didn't work out. In 2015, Russia decided they wanted Rachmaninoff's remains returned to the mother country, but so far that hasn't happened and it's probably unlikely that it'll happen. Rachmaninoff was well known for being one of the most gifted pianists ever, and it's really cool that you can actually go and listen to recordings of him play. Unlike some pianists from older generations like Chopin, you'll never be able to hear what he actually sounded like. His playing was always very clear and precise and it was never blurry or overpedaled. Part of this might have to do with the fact that he had gigantic hands, which means that mere mortals often struggle to, you know, people with normal hand size struggle to play his music. Rachmaninoff apparently could reach the span of a 12th, while most people could reach an eighth or a ninth. As someone with plenty of operatic experience, Rachmaninoff's playing and writing style was always first and foremost melodic and melody driven. Arthur Rubinstein had this to say about his playing. He had the secret of the golden living tone which comes from the heart. I was always under the spell of his glorious and inimitable tone which could make me forget my uneasiness about his two rapidly fleeting fingers and his exaggerated rubatos. Some of his recordings can actually be found online if you'd like to hear him play, including a performance of Liszt's Second Hungarian Rhapsody. He was a serious man, but he was also wry and witty. He wasn't so serious that he couldn't find enjoyment in life. But he would be the kind of guy from accounts that I was reading who could have his friends in stitches, but not even be cracking a smile himself. Igor Stravinsky described him as a six and a half foot scowl. An aspect of his music that I think also reflects his life is its detached nature. His music is it almost describes emotion as a pe- as opposed to being in the thick of emotion. His music has the sound of being an observer of drama as opposed to being the drama, if that makes any sense. It's, it's not that his music isn't emotional, but he removes himself enough from it that his music never sounds like really, really sentimental. Kind of like Tchaikovsky's music, which is very sentimental and over the top. Rachmaninoff's music is very different from that. But despite this stoicism and serious nature, his friends knew him to be a very kind and generous person. He had a similar manner in performing too. He would be completely stone-faced, not revealing any emotion. Some people even describing him as looking sad, but his hands would be like wildly energetic, flying around the keyboard, being very expressive. Pianist Eugene Istomin, a student of Rachmaninoff's as a child, described He looked like a convict. He was so big, so large, that the keyboard looked like a little checkerboard in front of him. I wasn't frightened at how he looked, but I was impressed. Music critic Harold Schoenberg said about Rachmaninoff, He was the perfect pianist, sans pareil, sans reproche. He was absolutely perfect, flawless, an aristocrat with a high sense of drama and an extraordinary sense of poetry. And he can convey this extraordinary charisma with so little effort. But this golden sound, another description of golden sound, came out of those perfectly programmed fingers. I don't think I ever heard him make a mistake. On the difficulty of Rachmaninoff's music, pianist Ruth Laredo said, I must say that preparing to play anything by Rachmaninoff demands more sheer work than any other composer I've ever played. 
By comparison, I'd say that Tchaikovsky, Brahms, or even Chopin are much more comfortable. Rachmaninoff is always asking you for more. You have to keep at it every single day. You never let go. You can never expect that it's going to be all right next time. The music does not stay in your hand. You can't let it go and then pick it up again and have it there. It just isn't there anymore. I don't know why. And that is all for today's video. This is the first in a series of Rachmaninoff videos that we're going to put out in the next couple months. We're going to be looking at his music and other aspects of that. So stay tuned for those videos. Videos. Thank you so much for watching. Give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and I will catch you in the next video. By 197 By 19 fun Ugh. No. Ugh.